Hi, we're doing a series of videos on composites. In the first video a few weeks ago, we talked about fiberglass, and in the last video, I talked about epoxy resin. Today, I'm going to talk about aggregates or admixtures, powders, that can be used to change the mechanical properties of the epoxy to use it for structural purposes. Epoxy is a polymerized plastic, and it's a wonderful adhesive, but because it has the consistency of honey, it tends to be very difficult to build up any kind of macroscopic structure from it. When you're trying to use say for example epoxy to create a joint in this case say a right angle butt joint if I was to put a line of glue on this wood and then adhere this it would be far stronger than say mounting this with screws which produce point loading it distributes the load and it's stronger but because I'm dependent on the breaking of the sort of bond at the edges there the amount of strength that I get is really only the distance across this piece of wood, which is about 18 millimeters or three quarters of an inch. In this case, because of the nature of the grain, I've actually got the disadvantage that I'm actually pulling the fibers apart. This would be a stronger joint because of the way that the fibers are running, but you don't always have that choice. And in any case, you have a mechanical disadvantage of a very narrow uh, bit of resistance to tipping versus the leverage of these parts. If I put enough force on this, I'm going to break this relatively easily, despite the fact that the epoxy is such an excellent glue. To build a much stronger joint, what we want to do is we want to create something like a triangular gusset so that the load paths across here are from here across here. That's far stronger and would be far stronger than the basic material. But epoxy won't do that because it runs. So what we want to do is we want to thicken up the epoxy to create a mixture that is going to be easier for us to work with. And the, the workhorse of everything on this table for most uh, operations inside of a composite shop is going to be wood flour. This is pine wood flour. And you can obtain this in different types of wood. Pine is the most common. And when mixed up with epoxy, will create a paste that looks indistinguishable from peanut butter. And you'll notice that throughout this whole video, I'm going to be using food references instead of complicated sort of viscosity numbers to describe the working properties and the endpoints when you're mixing these up because it's easily referable. Everybody kind of knows what the different foods and the substances are like. So peanut butter when we mix this together. And I'm going to show you how we do this. And you could use wood flour that comes from, say, a bandsaw or a table saw, your own. You could actually sweep it up. But because this is so inexpensive, it's very consistent when you obtain this in bulk and it's clean. It doesn't have any other dust or material in it. It probably isn't worth, worth harvesting your own. The one exception would be if you want to make a joint that has a similar color to the wood that you're working with, you can take those particles and mix them in to create a darker mixture. But keep in mind that when you add the epoxy, it will darken. So pine and pine will produce something that looks darker like peanut butter and pine you're going to have to blend them in order to create those colors. In any case, for structural application, applications, pine flour is excellent. And we use this so much that, for example, we order this in large quantities, tubs of this stuff, in order to build large structures like boats. And this whole container full probably costs about $40. So, you know, it's not much. Now, let me show you how we blend this up and sort of what the endpoints are. So I'm going to mix up, mix up some epoxy here. And let's get some gloves. A little trick with using gloves is if you are working with these nitrile gloves, they're not very stretchy. But if you don't have any problem with latex, sometimes putting on several gloves, double or triple gloving, you can dirty up the gloves. And rather than taking them off and putting them on, you can pull out an outer, outer layer of dirty gloves, and you have fresh gloves to work with. It's a nice way to make yourself fast and also to be very neat. In this case, we're not going to do too much, so I'm not that concerned about this. Now, we're going to mix up some resin here. And this is a 
one to two parts. So I'm going to mix up about 150 total. Give this two good minutes of mixing. And always mix up your epoxy combination before you add the powders. Don't add them to one component and think you're going to save time because it can affect the amount of epoxy resin part A and hardener part B that actually touch each other because of differential absorption in the powders. So mix up the liquid, then add your powders. Now we've given this about two minutes of mixing and we're going to start adding the powder. Now, I could give you ratios, but with the woods being relatively inconsistent in terms of, you know, from batch to batch, particle size and moisture content, really the end point here is going to be the viscosity of the final mixture, the powder that I'm mixing in here. And you want to start by blending it relatively slowly at first, because otherwise you'll get these clouds of dust all over the room. And as you blend this in, you can get a little bit more aggressive once you've got the material wet. And we'll keep adding material, keep adding powder, until we turn this into sort of a runny peanut butter, something between peanut butter and yogurt. These are going to be these food references. You're going to get hungry by the time we're done. Now, as you can see, it's kind of creamy and kind of runny. I can add a little more powder. But this obviously wouldn't stand up if I tried to make a paste out of this and tried to get this to form a shape, it's just going to sag. I could keep adding powder until I got to the point that this no longer ran, that this didn't sag anymore. The problem with that, though, is that you end up with something more like biscuit dough. It tends to be crumbly, and when you sand it, you get a lot of air pockets. So rather than try to get the final thickness from the wood flour alone, I take advantage of another material this, which is a silica thickener. It's called cabosil or fumed silica. This has a particle size down in the nanometer range. And because of that, it has much more surface area per cc or per gram than the wood does. So a very small amount of this material added to this will thicken it up quickly. Now, general rule of thought, general warning is that, yes, you should always work with a mask and you should always be very careful with these powders. For most of these, it's, it's good advice. For this, it is particularly important. I'm going to break that rule just because I want you to be able to see me and I want to be able to talk as opposed to through a mask. But because of the extremely small nature of these particles, they tend to get everywhere. You really can't work with this outside because even a small breeze will carry this into the air like dust. It's finer than dust. And as you'll see, even if I add this very, very carefully, you're going to see some of the particles can get into the air and dance around. So I'm going to be very careful about the mixing of this powder, but nevertheless, it will still tend to get into the air, even if I work with it very slowly. You can see how it clouds up like that. Now, another little sort of trick is when you mix this, the first mixing of this, go very slowly until you get it wet into the, the paste. That'll tend to keep it from rising up into the air. Once you kind of get it blended in, it's not going to form as much in the way of clouds. Now you can see I just added two small teaspoons of that material. Again, not to a quantity, to an end point. And you can see the mixture is beginning to thicken up substantially. If I add just a little bit more, very slowly, and you don't want to breathe this either. That's part of the reason why you really want to wear a mask with this material but I'm breaking my own rules. Very slow, very careful. See the dust coming out of there? It's kind of hard to keep that from happening, even if you know what you're doing. And we're going to blend this in. That's enough, see? OK. So now what we're going to do, for safety's sake, I'm going to close this one up. Move this away. Give this a final couple of blends. That's pretty nice. You can make it a little thicker, but it'll do for this demonstration. Now, we're going to create a gusset with this material.
And if I were simply to take this and kind of lather it in there, I'd, it'd be kind of a mess. It'd take time, it'd be messy, it'd get everywhere. So a trick that you can use is you can obtain these, uh, eBay, Amazon, for about two bucks a piece. It's a 10 ounce or 300 milliliter empty plastic caulking tube. And if we trowel some of this material into the tube, like this, and we will insert this into the caulking gun, we can trim the end of this, I can get a nice regular bead of the material to form the joint. Now one thing that you should keep in mind is that you can't make up a whole quantity of this stuff, keep this on the table, and then every so often you can just use it whenever you want to because you've got a pot life to this. It's gonna, whatever you fill this up with, you've got about whatever number of minutes the pot life of the epoxy is before you have to stop working with it. At $2 a pop, that's not real bad, but the point is if you need to do lots of little uh, applications, an easier and more convenient way to do that, oh, something I didn't say and I should warn you about. Don't leave a quantity of the solid material inside the tube when you're done with it. It'll get hot. So you've got to get rid of, got to get rid of the stuff and spread it out. There's another method that you can use that's cheaper, a little less neat, but is pretty convenient if you're doing small amounts of material. And that is if you take the epoxy paste in here that we've made up, this gusseting material, and you take a one quart or one liter sandwich bag that does not stand on its own. It's got a simple square bottom like this. Don't get the kind with the pleats. You can actually put this inside of the bag. Then once I've filled up the bag like this, and then I can squeeze this down, twist it around, and just like I'm doing cake decoration, I can use this to apply the epoxy to the joint like this. Now it's less reach, obviously my hands got to get closer so I don't have as much you know, coverage in terms of being able to get into a tight area. But as you can see, it works pretty well and produces a pretty nice surface. So a trick that you can use for giving yourself a surface that's not only appearance-wise appearance superior, but also then is easier for you to lay cloth into because it's a rounding, it's a radius. You can take sticks, popsicle sticks that are rounded or variable sized washers, and you can create a nice curved uh, joint by putting the popsicle stick at a very oblique angle. You see how I draw this like this and basically I'm not contacting it and I'm not doing anything. But as I make the uh, line steeper, you can see that I can get a nice rounded joint and as I continue to bring this up, the rounded joint will get to look really, really nice. I mean, that's smooth and hom homogenous. Now, if I go too far or the stick is too fine, I can end up creating sort of a mass on my stick. So the trick is always to start at a very shallow angle and bring it up in order to give myself a nice curve. If I've got more material, I might want to use a larger radius, again, starting like this, and I had so much material that you can see I got a little ridge even with a large radius, so it might have been better to go with an even larger radius. But as you can see, you can get a nice curve. Now, if you don't want to waste the time to fabricate this material, you can actually obtain this in a pre-mixed form from a number of suppliers like West System. System 3 makes this. And effectively, it's a proprietary mix of some of the thickener and some uh, plastic flowers, uh, flour, maybe uh, talcum powder, but bottom line is it works very well, it has similar properties, and uh, it will save you time. But this will cost you about four or five times as much per volume as making it yourself. So it's, it's your choice, what your time is worth. The next thing that you might want to do is you might want to be able to say, take care of defects in surfaces. If it turns out that, let's say we've got this example here, where we've got a joint between two boards that has sort of a crummy interface point here. It's got some damage that I created with a hammer. It's got scratches. It's got holes and dents. We want to create what's called a fairing compound, something that you can sand and will provide a nice smooth surface. For that application, we use glass, hollow glass microbeads, or balls, microballs, and phenolic microbeads. These materials here, when added in approximately equal volume to the epoxy,
will create a nice sandable paste that has about the same toughness as the wood. It won't uh, be removed any more quickly or many, any more slowly than the underlying wood. The wood flour produces a very tough material that is difficult to sand, and so it's, it's not as easy to work with when you're covering large surfaces. So let me show you how this stuff is made. Now we've mixed this for about two minutes, and now what we're going to do is we're going to add the beads. Unlike the cabosil, you can see that this powder tends to fall. It doesn't create quite the dust because these are sort of micron scale powder as opposed to nanometer scale powder. You'll want to add an amount of this approximately the same as the epoxy. So when I blend this in, I don't use weight. I generally don't even rely on volume with experience you'll get a feeling for adding less than you need, and then eventually what you'll end up finding is that you'll tweak the last 10 or 15% by adding more powder. But remember, you've already mixed the epoxy, so always under add the powder. You can always add more, but you can't really take it out. Because the material flows, you can fill joints by simply allowing the material to sort of drip in there. It will run in, it'll form a bead. You can remove the additional material if you choose to, but the stuff sands very, very easily. So it's not really that critical that you get it ultra flat. And you'll probably save more time having to sand that additional material off than if it turns out you went a little deep and you made a dent and then you have to do a second batch. Now, filling up the scratch, I think you can get away with that. And even the, the shallow dent here, because it will run into the sides of the, the dent. But for something like this, it's so steep that if I were to try to get this to flow into the surface, it's going to create a little bubble, which might be a void if I sand it into it, or may actually have a bubble that creates a crater after this cures. So when you have steep edged holes like this or dents, actually use a drill and broaden it out and create something more like a crater or a dent. You actually remove wood in order to make the hole go away. This will fill much better because the liquid can get into the bottom of the hole in order to cover it over. Now when you're done with this, cheap way to take care of any of the bumps, you could actually just do this and leave the surface covered up. But as you see, you can sometimes draw some of the material away and eh, this stuff sands so quickly that I tend to be rather generous with this in a horizontal application. Also, for what it's worth, in this material where it's runny, you're going to get excellent bonding because there's plenty of extra epoxy in this. But in the drier mixtures, sometimes it's a good idea to wipe it down with a little bit of the uncured epoxy before you apply this, just so that it sticks and you get good absorption of the material into the wood. You don't starve the joint. Be careful, though, not to be generous. You don't want a layer of clear epoxy underneath your filling material because you'll end up creating something that acts as a lubricant and prevents you from get, being able to actually apply this to the surface. Now, if we aren't dealing with a horizontal surface, and again, this material here will sand off in about 15 seconds. It's very quick. So even though this looks really very, very thick, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll work fine. It's very, very fast. And it isn't worth getting obsessive about trying to remove the, the last couple of millimeters. Now, if you have, say, a defect that's hor uh, vertical, you can't reorient this. Then go back to your cabosil. And adding cabosil to this material here that is runny, you can create something that is much more like plaster and will hold up to a vertical surface. Now, take a little bit of this and we can place it into a joint. Excellent, huh? Not at all difficult. And this will stay, this will cure, and this sands off very easily. This already is starting to get warm. So rather than throw the whole pot away, 
I'm going to break it up into smaller quantities so that it doesn't melt my garbage bag or my cup. Moving on. This material here is microfibers. This is a polypropylene. This is a glass microfiber. This, when added to the epoxy, will actually produce a stronger material than will the wood flour. It's about equivalent with the polypropylene. I don't like it quite as much because it's more difficult to work with, as I'll show you in a sec. Uh, but if you want something that is actually substantially stronger, the glass microfiber is the way to go. This will produce a stronger joint, but again, it's more difficult to work with. I'll show you what happens when you mix up some of this. All right, this has been about two minutes now. I'm going to now start adding some of this, this, some of this microfiber glass. This also doesn't tend to blow around very much. It kind of ties itself up in knots. But you'll see the property of this when blended in. It's a little weird. Now you can see that this is not that different from the wood flour, but it tends to be more like a jelly, kind of like snots. And it's a little more difficult to work with when you're trying to produce a gusset. It's not bad, but you have to get a little bit of experience with working with it. Moving down the line, these are the chopped fibers. Instead of microscopic, you know, sub-millimeter fibers, these things have dimensions, lengths on the order of a few millimeters. This is glass, this is carbon, and this is basalt. Now, all of these materials will add a substantial amount of strength versus the wood material. And you will use these in areas that you don't really want a nice finish. You saw how nice that joint was that I put together. It really looked pretty smooth. It would be very nice to put fiberglass over it. These, because of the spiky nature of the, of the fibers, don't work very well. But if you've got a hidden joint and you want a lot of strength, say you're putting oak together, you want something really strong, using the chopped fibers is a good op opportunity or a good option. The difference between the fibers is that this is very cheap. This probably cost about 20 cents, 25 cents. The carbon, despite the fact that it's carbon fiber, is not that expensive because it comes from offcuts when they're manufacturing pristine rolls of carbon fiber. And so this is sort of what's left over. Nevertheless, this is the strongest of all of the materials. It produces a gusset or a, a macroscopic structure that is as strong in modulus, compression and tension, as solid aluminum. It's as strong as metal. And this can actually be used to do what we just did with the wood with aluminum. Properly preparing the surface and making up material like this, you can avoid the heat damage that's associated with welding aluminum. You'll get a joint that's nearly as strong. You can also avoid the heating of structures that may have, say, heat sensitive components on them rather than welding. And if you don't know how to weld, this produces a nice alternative. However, it has working properties that are challenging. And I'm going to show you what this is like when you mix it up. OK, now we've let this go for about two minutes. And I'm going to add the carbon. Now, you don't need to add very much of this, as you'll see. This is just maybe two little scoops of the material. Not very much. And you'll see what happens. Right now, we've got this runny mixture with these carbon particles in it. As we start to blend this in, and the very, very tiny fibers, much smaller than the glass, begin to wet out with the epoxy. What you end up with is something that looks like your cat threw it up. It's like hairballs. It's nasty. And I didn't even add quite enough carbon at this point. But as you can see, it's a kind of stringy, furball-looking material, but with a little bit more carbon in it. As I said, the structural properties of this stuff are awesome. Now, if it turns out that you're into green, and we've discovered that nowadays what's becoming very popular in the concrete industry, uh, we have been working with concrete, uh, ultra high performance concrete, and did a little bit of research. And these are basalt fibers. Essentially degassed lava, molten rock, is extruded just like the glass, forming it into fibers. It can be made into rebar. It can be made into a mesh of cloth. What's nice about this is unlike the polyacrylonitrile hydrogen-treated you know, petroleum product of carbon, uh, 
this is potentially green. And it's intermediate in terms of its properties. It's not quite as strong as the carbon. It's not as expensive as the carbon. And it comes in a variety of different lengths. The shorter the length, the easier it is to work. The longer the length, the uh, stronger it is. I've worked with this a little bit, and actually, I kind of like it. It's uh, kind of a neat material, so it's something to keep in mind, and we'll get into that more when we get into the concrete. Now, the following three powders here, graphite, aluminum powder, and dendritic copper, these can be added to the epoxy to create a tougher material. Frequently, aluminum powder is added to, say, the skeg of a boat. It makes it much more damage resistant. All of these block UV light. Uh, epoxy is sensitive to UV degradation. When you put these metal powders or carbon powder into the um, epoxy, it will prevent the UV light from transmitting into the material and prevents breakdown of the, of the uh, epoxy. In addition, unlike a dye, these materials can change the color of the epoxy and can be used as primers. If you want a dark primer, you want a light primer, you want a brown primer, you can have something underlying your paint that if you scratch it, you're not going to see white or some other material underneath. It acts as a great primer. In addition, what's pretty interesting is this dendritic copper. Dendritic copper is electrolytically grown and it's fractal. It looks like a fern or a snowflake underneath a microscope. And because of its extremely high surface area and its large scale sort of uh, uh, bi-directional structure, flat planes, fern-like, this material acts as a really good thermal um, transmission material. We've been working with graphene and silver powders and diamond powders in order to try to create a competitive thermal grease, something that can beat Arctic silver. It's harder than we originally thought, and much of it isn't so much the materials, it is the dispersion within the, the silicon oil that's frequently used as the matrix. Turns out that epoxy tends to disperse this material very well, and as a consequence, when we make up a material with this in epoxy, it is competitive with the thermal epoxies out there, about the same thermal conductivity, but far less expensive. If you look for thermal greases, you can get them relatively inexpensively. Look for thermal epoxies, and they're incredibly expensive. This works just about as well. This is nanoscale aluminum nitride. This also is a high thermal conductivity material. Doesn't work as well as the dendritic copper when mixed into epoxy as a thermal uh, medium. But what we found is that when you blend the two of these, these small particles seem to get in between the, the leaves of the dendritic copper and provide what appears to be a superior material at far lower costs. We'll get into that when we get into the thermal interface materials. Moving down the line, this is boron nitride. Boron nitride cubic is the second hardest material known to man, just behind diamond. Hexagonal, it tends to have uh, molecular properties similar to graphite or molybdenum disulfide. It's a very uh, lubricating, slippery material. When added to the epoxy, this material is almost like a poor man's Teflon or an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, but something that you can mold into low friction surfaces. It also makes it tougher. It's kind of an interesting material and is, again, very inexpensive. Moving on, these here are ballistic uh, uh, samples for ballistic barriers, essentially armor plating. And what we did is, in doing so much research as we did back behind me, you can see some of our concrete speakers, learned a little bit about what makes concrete so strong. It isn't the cement that acts as the glue, in this case, epoxy. It's what you put in it. When you take particles of a single size or homogeneous size and you try to pack them together, the greatest amount of density that you will get is about 67%. The rest is voids. In this case, it would be filled with epoxy or cement if you're making concrete. In order to get a stronger material, because it's the admixture that adds the strength, not the cement, not the epoxy, you do a thing called densification. And the way that works is you take large particles, like gravel, and you add between them smaller particles, like sand, to create more dense filler for the matrix, because it's the glue doesn't matter how thin it is, it just matters that it contacts everything. So what we decided to do is to build essentially epoxy-based concrete, but we're using some really unusual materials. These are aluminum oxide abrasive grains. They are very, very tough. They're hardened, they're ceramic, 
They're much stronger than, say, gravel or granite. But the point is, they're also somewhat porous on their surface, so they get an excellent bond with the epoxy. But because they tend to be rather large, what we've done is we've added silicon carbide. Now, if you look carefully in my hand at this material, you'll see that the silicon carbide has got a very porous, rough, granular surface. Again, excellent for bonding to the epoxy. And it tends to fill the gaps in between the gravel so we get more densification. And in ultra-high performance concrete, what is done is they add a, a third powder, which is called fume silica. It's not the same as the cabosil. It's more of a micron to two micron scale silica powder to, again, increase the densification and double or triple the strength of the concrete. In our case, we elected to use titanium-coated diamond. Now, this is actually not that expensive from China. And the reason for the titanium coating is that diamond itself, if you look at sort of uh, abrasive diamond, tends to be rather slippery, rather smooth. It will bond to epoxy, but because of the slippery particles, you don't tend to get the good sort of mechanical tooth type of bonding that you can get when you put the titanium coating on. And because this is a titanium that under temperature goes to titanium carbide, which will actually form a covalent bond with the diamond, the bond between the metal and the diamond is as strong as the titanium, two orders of magnitude stronger than the epoxy. And then when this is used as the final filler for the concrete, we create these disks. In this case, we've got the ceramic aluminum oxide and the um, silicon carbide. And in this, we have the diamond and the silicon carbide. And the purpose for this is that as a ballistic barrier, if a high velocity projectile were to try to run through here, the large gravel is likely to fracture or redirect it, cause it to tumble or uh, distort. The very abrasive, very hard and tightly bonded silicon carbide will abrade the material or the fragments that go through it, and the diamond will help to hold everything together and add, theoretically, potentially, not sure, additional resistance to penetration. Placing a layer of, say, Kevlar or Dyneema on each side of this to prevent the fragments from being able to get through or spall or uh, um, fractured material from being able to leave the front surface. That's something else we're going to work on. But these things are remarkable because not only can we potentially build composite armor that would be moldable, but it's something you could do yourself. You don't have to have sintering ovens. You don't have to have you know any fancy uh, equipment other than a small vacuum chamber that you can get online and these materials, which are not that expensive. This is probably about 30 bucks worth of diamond. This is about uh, 50 cents worth of silicon carbide. This is about a buck worth of this gravel. It's not that expensive. So in sort of conclusion, there's a lot of different powders you can use here. The workhorses are here. The exciting stuff, the sort of cutting edge stuff is over there. But if you like what we're doing here, I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe, ring the bell, give us a comment. Anything that you can do that shows engagement with the channel helps YouTube to promote us. And most importantly, if you know people that might be interested in this or might learn something from this, appreciate it if you'd share the videos because that, again, increases our, our audience and helps us to grow. So I want to thank you very much for your uh, watching the program, and I will look forward to seeing you soon. You have a good night.